So it's good to be back. I'm excited for these summer nights. I'm excited to, um, oh yeah, by the way, if you don't know who I am, I'm the new students pastor. My name is Roman Flores. Nice to meet you. You, you don't have to clap. You don't have to clap. You're, you, well, you'll, you're about to hear about the real hero. Don't worry. Um, so speaking of heroes, we're talking about heroes. We're talking about some of the heroes of the Bible. Um, and when you hear heroes, you might think of superheroes, right? Um, we all know the story of Peter Parker. Does anyone know who that is? Peter Parker. Peter Parker, he got bit by a radioactive spider and he became who? Spider-Man, right. He has superhuman strength. He can climb walls. He can shoot webs. But there's this quote, famous quote from Spider-Man. It's not from Spider-Man, but from his Uncle Ben. Does anyone know what it is? With great power comes great responsibility. (laughs) With great power comes great responsibility. There have been countless men with great power over the centuries, but they've used it to hurt. They've used it to kill, take advantage of people, to get what they want. They all have tried to be their own hero. And we even see that in Scripture with our Sunday school heroes, men with great power, but they fail. Tonight, we're starting by looking at Adam, the first human, the one who was made good, the only man besides Jesus that was born without a sin nature, or he was created. No sin nature. We all know what happens, but before we get into it, Let me pray. Lord, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for the opportunity to open up your word and learn. Learn how all these great men of the past were only great men at best. And Lord, I pray that as we we look to you, we see that you are the, the much greater hero. The only one who can save. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here tonight who doesn't know you, I pray that they would come to know you tonight. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God, who always has been, always is, and always will be, created everything. Day and night, land and sea, the sun and the moon, things that swim, things that run, things that fly. God created our amazing universe with a word. He created everything. Not because he needed to. God needs nothing. God had and has everything perfectly within himself. Perfect love. Perfect fellowship. Perfect communion within the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Perfect. But God chose to create the beauty and power and goodness of our invisible God would now be visible. And out of all the things that he created, out of all of creation, God made something special. We read in Genesis that on the sixth day, God created man. And man was special because God made him in his own image. Man was a living, breathing picture of God, a mirror to show the world what he is like, a mirror to reflect his glory. So from the dust, God created Adam, and from Adam's rib, he created Eve. They were both made in God's image, and God called them good. They were told to have dominion over all the earth, to be fruitful and multiply so that they could spread God's image all over the earth, so that they could show the goodness and greatness all over the globe, the goodness of God. And things were off to an amazing start. Our hero, Adam, was doing good at first. God was pleased with his creation. He called it good, and he rested on the seventh day. But things didn't stay good for very long. Three chapters into the Bible. You're thinking, come on, Adam, come on. Genesis 3. 
Everything started to fall apart. God had told Adam and Eve that they could eat anything in the garden, anything except this one tree. Anything but this one tree. And what did they do? They ate of the tree. Adam failed. Adam, our hero, the first human, failed. They chose to believe the devilish snake instead of their good creator. They disobeyed God's word and they brought in sin and death. God's good creation was broken. The fellowship between God and man was broken. Adam could no longer walk with God in the garden. Our hero became a villain. And so our good God couldn't be with these people who had become so bad, and so he kicks them out of the garden. He kicks them out of heaven on earth, and he killed an animal to cover their naked shame and sin, and he cursed them, and he cursed the snake. But in the middle of cursing them, our good God, our good and gracious and merciful God gave them a promise. He promised that one of Eve's children would crush the serpent's head and save them. And no one knew who this was. No one knew when he would come. But even though they disobeyed and God could have justly punished Adam and Eve and ended this whole creation thing right then and there, he promises a savior. He promises a hero. And that is what a big majority of the Old Testament is is about. Is this the hero? Is this the hero? Is Is it Cain? Is it Abel? Is it Noah? Is it Abraham? Is it Moses? What about King David, the the man after God's own heart? It must be him. What about the great and wise Solomon? What about the prophets? Who is this promised seed? Who is the promised Messiah? All these quote-unquote great men keep coming and failing. All these great heroes, they keep failing. Then all of a sudden, after a long silence, after the prophets, the true and better hero appears. We see in Luke 2, 10 and 11, we see angels bursting out to this group of shepherds saying, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. For unto you is born this day the hero that you have been waiting for. But he doesn't show up in the typical superhero way. He doesn't show up and look or act or do the things that they expected. The angels say, you will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. This great hero of the Bible shows up as a little baby wrapped in swaddling clothes in a manger where the animals are. Nothing fancy, no palace, no superhero cape. Jesus, the Messiah, the second person of the Trinity is born into a poor family. This is our hero. This is the hero who would live and die and raise from the dead to save all who would believe. And so tonight, I want to quickly show you three characteristics about Jesus, the greater hero, the one greater than Adam. Three things. Jesus is the better representative. That's number one. Two, Jesus is the better man. And three, Jesus is the better hero. Three things. Jesus is the better representative, he's the better man, and he is the better hero. So now, if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of Romans. The book of Romans. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to 21. <clears throat> the section's called Death and Adam, Life in Christ. Starting in verse 12, it says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. 
For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass, for if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. That one man is Adam. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus is the better representative. Adam, our champion, the crown of creation, the top of our family tree, the one without a sin nature, brought death. It says, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man. Adam was our representative. He was our federal head. And when he sinned, he brought sin into the bloodline. If that's confusing, I've heard someone explain it like this. If the president of the United States declares war on a country, at war. If the president says we're at war with this country, declares war, that means every single one of us are at war with that country even though we didn't make that decision ourselves. The president is our representative. He is our federal head. And so with Adam, our great, 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 great grandpa, our representative, when he sinned, we all sinned. He brought sin to all of us because we were all in him. And now after him, everyone who is born is born into sin. We are now born with a sin nature. We are born spiritually dead. We are born helpless. We're born sinners. But Adam, like verse 14 says, was a type of the one who was to come. Adam was our representative in the garden, and Jesus came to represent us as well. Our first representative plunged us into sin, but Jesus, the better representative, brings grace and life and justification. In order for Jesus to stand in our place, he had to be like us. He had to be born a human. Does that make sense? We're not dogs, so Jesus didn't come as a dog. He had to be born a human. He had to be born of a virgin. This is so important. He had to be born of a virgin so that he wouldn't inherit that sin nature like we do. Do you see why the virgin birth is so important? Sometimes we just glance over it at Christmas. But Jesus had to be born of a virgin. We have to believe in this because if he wasn't born of a virgin, he wouldn't be able to save. If he was born with that sin nature, he wouldn't be perfect. Jesus was born of a virgin so that he wouldn't inherit that Adamness. So that he wouldn't be born a sinner. So that he could be the better Adam. So that he could be the better representative. That's why he had to be human. He came to be the better representative for us. He came to do what Adam failed to do. And that was to obey, to fulfill all righteousness. And so Jesus is the better representative. Number two, Jesus is the better man. So Jesus doesn't, just come. He doesn't just wrap himself in human flesh 
to represent us, die really quick, and then boom, gone into heaven. No. Jesus did much more than die. He did much more than that. Jesus came and lived. You see, when you put your trust in Christ, you don't just get his death in your place. Jesus didn't just die for you as your representative. Jesus lived for you. Jesus was the better man. Verse 19 says, For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Adam's disobedience made us all what? Sinners. But by the one man's obedience, by Jesus' obedience, the many, a.k.a. all those who would believe, will be made righteous. This is amazing. This is amazing stuff. This is so important for you to grasp and understand and hold on to. Jesus came and lived from a baby up until he was an adult perfectly. He obeyed perfectly. Now, if he was your brother, like, it'd probably be kind of annoying to have a perfect brother. You know what I mean? But Jesus was perfect. He lived perfect. Adam lived and he made a huge mess, but Jesus didn't just clean up. Jesus lived clean. And so when we put our faith in him, we get that clean life, not just his death. We get his righteous life. Does that make sense? It's the great exchange. Have you ever heard it called that? It's the great exchange. Our sin for his righteousness. Our broken, sinful life for his perfect one. It's like showing up to a party that has a gift exchange. Has anyone ever done a gift exchange like at a Christmas party? And you know, you bring your gift and then you, like, you might see one that you want to trade with. But think about this. You show up to this party with this gift exchange and you bring sin. You bring tons and tons of sin. Now who's going to want to trade with you? Who's going to want to trade their, their nice Starbucks gift card with that? No one. No one wants to trade with that except Jesus. Jesus came to trade you his righteous, perfect life for your sin. Jesus brought salvation to the gift exchange and you brought sin. And all it takes is faith. Faith to get it. And you know what? Jesus even gifts you that too. Faith is a gift from God. This is amazing. This is so one-sided. Praise the Lord. Adam lived and failed while Jesus lived and obeyed. Adam brought sin. Jesus brings life. He is the better representative and the better man. Number three, Jesus is the better hero. Verse 20 says, Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where, the, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, Grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So Adam, our hero, had everything that he needed. He had everything that he could ever dream of in the garden. He didn't have a sin nature. God said that he was good. And when he faced temptation, one time, what did he do? He sinned. He gave into the temptation. But Jesus, the greater hero, in Luke 4, it says Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Spirit for 40 days. 40 days! Being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days. We go like three hours and then we want to sin. Jesus went 40 days and he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing. And when they were ended, he was hungry, it says. Luke 4, verse 2, 3. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. Now listen, if you were a superhero or you were, I don't know, you had these powers and you could change a stone to bread and you were starving for 40 days, all those rocks would be bread. <laughs> but Jesus, Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. He didn't give in to the devil's temptation. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. 
and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whom I will. If you then worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written. Jesus kept pointing back to Scripture. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And then he, the devil, took him to Jerusalem, and he took him to the tippy top of the temple, and he said, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. Now here's this, the creepy part. Satan then quotes Scripture to Jesus. He will command the angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. I read all that to tell you this. Adam, in the perfect conditions, when tempted, failed. Jesus, in the wilderness, hungry and tired, when tempted three times, was victorious. Jesus is the greater Adam. Adam failed and sinned, and you see, this isn't just Adam. This is us. Jesus, yes, Adam brought sin and death, but the law comes and shows us that we aren't what we were created to be. God's word shows us that we are sinners. We're not what we, create, we were created to be. We were created to love and enjoy and obey and trust God. But instead, we want to be our own God. Instead of worshiping our creator, we worship his creation. We want to worship ourselves. We are rebels. We are villains. We're sinners. Ephesians 2 says that we are dead in our sin following the prince of the power of the air. Now who's that? That's the devil. We follow him, a.k.a. the snake. So how are we, are we any different than our hero, Adam? No, we're no different. It's like the Spider-Man meme where they're pointing at each other and they're the same. We're just like Adam, our great, great, great grandpa. We want to go our own way. And some of you are still trying to go your own way. Some of you haven't turned to Christ yet. Some of you are still trying to be the hero of your own story. Some of you think that you can make it to heaven on your own power. And you say, well, well, I go to church, or, well, I, I serve, and I read my Bible, and I pray, and I come to TG, and I, and I, and I. Matthew 7, 21 to 23 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, on that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. This is a scary passage. It's scary to think that one day God could say, depart from me, I never knew you. But here's the thing. There's something that these guys here in Matthew 7 are doing. And if you know the secret, this can actually bring some comfort. On the day of judgment, when the all-powerful, all-seeing, all-knowing God opens the books, what are you going to say? Are you going to be like these people in Matthew 7 that say, I prophesied, I, I cast out demons, and I did many mighty works in your name, and I, and I, and I. What are you going to say when God opens the books of everything you've done, thought, and said? Are you going to say, I was the hero? I did all these great things for you? Or are you going to point to the cross? Are you going to point to Jesus? Are you going to say like Martin Luther? He says, I admit that I deserve death and hell. I admit it. But what of it? What of it? I know one who has made satisfaction on my behalf. I know of the one who has made satisfaction in my place as my representative. When you die, I know that's not really something you young people think about death that much, but when you die, who are you calling on to be your hero? 
We for sure don't want Adam. He failed. But is it yourself? Are you trusting in your own works? Or are you going to trust Jesus, the greater hero, the one who wrapped himself in human flesh, the better representative, the one who lived the perfect life, the better man, the better human, the one who died in our place, the better hero. Who is your hero? I hope it's Jesus. Because if it's anyone else, if it's yourself, you're doomed. Like I said, we are sinners. Now, what's a good God supposed to do with sinners like us? Remember, God is good and God is just. And he can't just let it go by on, we can't let us just go by on our own. He can't, he can't just let us get away with it. He can't just sweep our sin under the rug. Otherwise, he wouldn't be good or just. He has to punish us for our sin. Or, or he can send a better representative into the world, a better human, one who can save and be the hero for all of these villains. But what hero would want to do that? What hero would lay down his life for the bad guys, the rebels? Not Superman. Batman isn't laying his life down for the Joker. Spider-Man isn't sacrificing himself for the Green Goblin. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5.8. God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Do you see the beauty of the gospel? Do you see what Jesus has done for us? This is the good news. Bad people like us can be saved. Jesus offers salvation, eternal life to all who would put their faith in him and turn from their sin. Our God is such a good and loving hero. So please don't wait. Tomorrow's not promised. Someone tonight couldn't make, could, might not make it home tonight. I mean, we pray against that, but we don't know. So don't wait. Satan wants you to wait. He wants you to say, oh, I'll do that tomorrow because he knows tomorrow's not promised. Don't wait. Don't take God's mercy and grace for granted. Now back to the garden really quick. After Adam failed, after the fall, what was the first thing that Adam hears? It is the voice of, of the greater hero. It's God saying, Adam, where are you? God is so merciful and gracious. Right when he could have ended creation and punished Adam and Eve, he promises to provide a hero, and he kept that promise. God is faithful. He sent Jesus the only one who can save us. Trust him and only him tonight. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your revelation of what you've done for us. Lord, it's amazing that, it's amazing that you created in the first place. You didn't have to. You had everything perfect within yourself. Perfect joy and love and and fellowship, and everything within yourself. But Lord, you created, and you created a good creation, and that good creation rebelled against you. And Lord, we are so thankful that you didn't end it there because you could have. Lord, thank you for sending your son into this broken world to live amongst sinners and to live perfect and be our representative, to live for us and die for us and then raise from the dead so that all who believe in, in him and him alone can also raise one day. Lord, we are so thankful for the gospel. I pray that everyone here would believe it and live it out. Lord, we love you and we thank you and we are overwhelmed by what you've done for us. We love you in Jesus' name, amen. Hey. 
Thanks for tuning in to our Redeemer YouTube channel. If this is helpful for you, please make sure that you like this video, smash the subscribe button, and hit that bell icon. It will help us reach more people with biblical truth. Thank you so much.